afternoon. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed that I'm not Joan Kerr, uh, but rest assured she'll be with you in just a minute. My name is Downing Thomas. I'm Associate Provost and Dean of International Programs here at the University of Iowa. I'm here to welcome you to a very special edition of World Canvas. It is special for a couple of reasons. We are kicking off International Education Week, a joint initiative of the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Department of Education, intended to promote programs that prepare Americans for a global environment and attract future leaders from abroad to study, learn, and exchange experiences in the United States. I'm pleased to announce that Governor Culver has declared November 15th through the 19th International Education Week here in the state of Iowa. Many of us are involved on a weekly and even daily basis in international education. Our students, staff, community members, and faculty here at the University of Iowa, such as Professor Rex Honey, whom we are sad to say we recently lost. In addition to opening International Education Week, we are also here to honor Richard and Mary Jo Stanley with International Program's first International Impact Award, which we created this year to recognize distinguished alumni and friends who have made an important international contributions that have benefited the University of Iowa and Iowans as our university's global profile continues to grow. For the presentation of the award, I would like to invite to the podium President Sally Mason, the 20th president of the University of Iowa, and herself a daughter of uh, parents who came to the United States from abroad. President Mason. I want to first start with congratulations to Downing and to Joan and others in international programs for all the great work that they continue to do on behalf of the university and particularly on behalf of our students. It's a great, great honor actually and a pleasure to be at this very special presentation of the very first University of Iowa International Programs International Impact Award. And I can't think of better people to receive this award than the Stanleys. So it's a special delight to help present it to some incredible friends of the University of Iowa, as you heard, Dick and Mary Jo Stanley. The Stanley family has been a central part of the University of Iowa's globalization of its educational curriculum, its research programs, and its service and its outreach for decades. Dick and Mary Jo have continued the amazing legacy established by Dick's parents Maxwell and Elizabeth Stanley over 30 years ago. And they've established their own legacy now through their personal support and their leadership throughout the years. The general public knows the Stanley name through HNI Corporation, the world's second largest office furniture manufacturer. Stanley Consultants, which provides en engineering, environmental, and construction services worldwide. And the Stanley Foundation, which focuses on peace and security issues and advocates principled multilateralism. Dick Stanley currently chairs the Stanley Foundation, is chairman emeritus of Stanley Consultants, and he served on the board, uh, the board of directors of HNI. Dick and Mary Jo Stanley have supported and provided leadership to the University of Iowa in many ways over the years, including such areas as the Colleges of Engineering, and Liberal Arts and Sciences, Hancher Auditorium, the UI Libraries, and of course, the UI Art Museum. But they have continued the legacy of the Stanley family by making their special mark on support and leadership for international efforts at the University of Iowa. I mentioned to Dick just before this started that without him, so many opportunities for our students and our faculty would have been lost, and we very much appreciate his particular interest in this area. Now, the public is probably most familiar with the world-class Stanley collection of African art in our Museum of Art. The Stanley family continues to support that collection and the study of African art here at the university, and we're very pleased by that, too. 
Yet their support for international study, research, and programming is even more widespread through international travel funds for faculty research, international research and study abroad scholarships for students, globalization of the curriculum, public programming on international issues, faculty chairs focused on international issues, and much, much more. Personally, Dick and Mary Jo Stanley have contributed significantly to the university's international efforts. They've endowed their own scholarships for undergraduate study abroad and funds for international faculty research opportunities. They've supported the conservation of the African art collection, including new acquisitions and they've supported the international writing program. The University of Iowa is a globally connected and internationally aware institution. That's always been a hallmark of our academic excellence, and it's only more important these days and important in these very, very globalized times. I think we are very, very fortunate that Dick and Mary Jo have been such incredible friends and partners over so many years. I think our international programs would in many ways not be what they are today without the vision and the generosity of the Stanleys and their remarkable contributions in all ways to the University of Iowa. So I think it's more than fitting that Dick and Mary Jo, who unfortunately couldn't be with us this evening, receive our first International Impact Award. And I am very, very proud to be part of today's presentation. Thank you, and thank you, Dick. Thank you very much, uh, President Mason. Uh, Mary Jo and I are both deeply honored by this recognition. Uh, we are humbled and very appreciative of the work that is being done in globalization of the university, in the international programs area and across the university. And uh, we give strong tribute to President Mason's leadership in this area, to Downing Thomas's, Mary Jo, as you know, unfortunately cannot be here. Uh, she's under a what we believe is a temporary, uh, non-serious medical situation where her doctor said she better stay home today. So she is sick at heart not being here and not being able to share uh, in this uh, recognition. But we are deeply honored and very appreciated, appreciative of it. Thank you very much. turn to have a chance to talk to you just a moment about uh, your life. We, we want to um, go back a few years. We know a little bit about what you've done in these last many, many years, but what was it like for you growing up? Tell us something about the life you lived as a kid and what your parents were like. Well, I think uh, both Mary Jo and I benefited from parents who had a strong global interest and global perspective. Uh, Mary Jo's father was a Presbyterian pastor, and uh, she recalls in her early childhood days that often there would be visitors, uh, fraternal workers, from places around the world who would come stay with her parents, stay in the house, and of course she then got the benefit of uh, talking with them and uh, listening to them and uh, becoming very interested in what, uh, what goes on in the world. A couple of her early prized possessions were a book uh, from China and a doll from India uh, that had been given to her by some of these uh, visitors. Uh, her parents, shortly after they were married, were looking very much into the possibility of uh, becoming fraternal workers uh, in China. And uh, that their interest in that cooled when they found out that they would both, their mother was a registered nurse, 
uh, that uh, both were very acceptable to the program, but if they accepted, they would be based uh, 200 miles apart. And uh, 200 miles in China is a lot further than 200 miles in the, in the United States with an inter interstate system. Uh, but through the years, uh, they had uh, continuing interest in, in international work. Uh, for my part, uh, I think my interest and awareness of the larger world probably grew out of the fact that, first of all, my mother's parents uh, immigrated to this country uh, from Northern Europe. Uh, secondly, my uh, father's family, which has English roots going back many, many years, uh, included my grandfather, who was a member of the National Guard, served uh, on active duty in World War I as a part of the uh, Rainbow Division. National Guard units from across the country were assembled into uh, a, a single division uh, Douglas MacArthur was the commanding officer of that at one point, and uh, I think that built an awareness. My early recollections of World War II were as a child, uh, I, I remember in junior high school, the, the junior high band assembling in 1945 when the, uh, the war was won and playing the national anthem uh, in the main central hallway in the old junior high school and uh, uh, that being that celebration. Uh, my father uh, was impacted, I'm sure, by that uh, uh, experience as a young man, uh, actually the, a boy still, when his uh, father went off to war. And, and I think early came to the conclusion that there should be a better way of resolving the differences that we have in this world uh, than by going to war and the need for international collaboration, for working with and understanding each other, I think was a very strong one uh, in his mind. Early after uh, World War II, uh, he became very interested in the uh, development of the United Nations uh, as an organization that we had hopes would be able to do, and in fact has, in many cases, been successful in dealing with uh, international conflicts, helping meet international needs, by no means a perfect organization, one that needs further development, but that was one that uh, uh, he had a great deal of interest. He read the book uh, Anatomy of Peace by e Emery Reeves at that time and became uh, very much sold on the need for international institutions to deal with uh, the challenges, the opportunities, the needs that we have. And so that's kind of the growing up period. We, we both of us point to a, a teacher in the Muscatine school system by the name of Catherine Miller, who uh, was a true global educator before that term was invented. Uh, she was very interested in improving the lot of people uh, long before there was a uh, migrant uh, task force, migrant communities, she uh, took it upon herself to try to help improve the lot of migrant workers who were in Muscatine. Uh, we have an H.J. Heinz plant there, and in those days, tomatoes and cucumbers were raised locally, and they were harvested and picked by uh, migrant workers, in, uh, uh, and uh, those migrant workers were not always very well treated by others in the community. Uh, and she wanted to uh, work to improve their lot. Mary Jo and I had known each other because Mary Jo moved uh, to the community uh, when she was in junior high school. But uh, Catherine Miller, uh, in the summer of 1951, assembled a group of her former students, that's me and her current students of Spanish, to try to help teach some English to some of the migrant workers who were not at all fluent in English. And uh, the first evening when she gathered all of us in her uh, living room to help get us organized and lay out what the goals of this uh, program were going to be, uh, Mary Jo and I happened to sit next to each other. And as we say, the rest is history. <laughs> 
But all through my life, I've had uh, you know, a, a perception that uh, we need to understand that we're part of a global community. We need to find ways of understanding each other and working together. And indeed, if one looks at the uh, survival issues of the future, they are issues that no one country, uh, no one continent can solve. Yeah, like it or not, we're in this together. Like it or not, the people uh, who are trying to build careers these days uh, are in a situation where they have to work together. They need to understand each other, and this is where a lot of the work the international programs uh, 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 tries to deal with uh, becomes very important. Because anyone trying to forge a career, anyone actually living in the world today needs to have a reasonable comfort and a reasonable competence to work internationally and interculturally. And because the University of Iowa and its international programs in particular try to build that comfort and that competence, that's why Mary Jo and I are so interested and so excited about what's being done because it's contributing small steps, piece at a time, toward a world in which maybe we can get along better. Maybe we can do a better job of dealing with the survival issues. And that's the real challenge we face, because if we fail to deal with those survival issues, uh, the consequence will be non-survival, nothing that anybody wants. So. I started off talking about how we grew up. But <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this, this is just wonderful. Um, maybe I'll, I'll ask you, um, what was your first international, your first overseas experience, either as a single person or a married person? Uh, where did you go first together? Well, I think my first trip was a trip to Liberia. The uh, Stanley Consultants uh, was then uh, doing some work in Liberia. We started working in Liberia in the mid-50s. And uh, we were, uh, had people in Liberian office there working on the power system. Uh, and uh, uh, about that time, we got an opportunity to uh, do some work in Nigeria. Uh, they were at that time importing substantially all of the Portland cement concrete used in the country. And they had the raw materials needed to, to make it there. Uh, the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Brothers Fund commissioned us uh, to do a feasibility study uh, of whether it was practical and how it should be done to build a, uh, a cement manufacturing, Portland cement manufacturing plant in Nigeria. I ended up spending, uh, shopping in Liberia and then spending about eight weeks in northern, uh, uh, predominantly in the northern part of Nigeria. At that time, it was divided into to three uh, provinces, three states. Uh, it has since subdivided into a large uh, number more. But uh, that was a great, uh, a great experience for me, both in terms of feeling I was doing something worthwhile and having the first-hand experience of being the foreigner. I was in a country that was not mine, and I learn to appreciate what the people in that country were doing and what this was very early in their, their independence uh, period and they were you know, struggling to work their way out of uh, the British uh, colonial uh, role uh, and they were still in transition. At that time many of the heads of the various ministries in Nigeria uh, were Nigerians but the permanent secretaries, who were sort of the uh, operating officer people, uh, were still in many cases uh, uh, British. And the British people had in those positions had the task of trying to develop uh, indigenous capability, something that has become a, 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 an increasing hallmark of the work that Stanley Consultants has done uh, internationally. So that was in 61. Uh, I think our uh, Mary Jo's and my first joint trip overseas was to uh, uh, Norway 
1965, excuse me, 1967, when we went to uh, uh, a meeting of the World Association of World Federalists, an organization working to try to strengthen the United Nations, make it more effective. Uh, and there we had a wonderful experience with uh, meeting and talking with and being hosted by a number of Norwegians that uh, we had met two years before in a similar meeting in San Francisco. So uh, I, I can remember in, I think it was 1953, when my father made his uh, first overseas trip, and that was a really big deal. Uh, we, all of us went up to the Moline Airport. <laughs> Terminal was a very small little thing. And uh, we, we thought, we watched him climb into a DC-3, uh, which, you know, really modern aircraft of the time, and uh, watched him take off. And he was going to Europe for, in conjunction with a World Association of World Federalists role that he had uh, uh, been elected to. So uh, it perhaps has taken, because Mary Jonah and I were talking uh, a few days back, and uh, we have eight grandchildren, all eight of them ranging in ages from uh, almost six to, 40, to 23. All eight of them have traveled internationally, uh, uh, some of them uh, uh, more than once. And, and so I think the interest in, in things global uh, seems to have translated down uh, at least two generations. I, I would just like to ask you a question about um, your, your, your devotion and your family's long devotion to, to looking for the peaceful solution, the, the way to cooperate, whatever differences we have with other countries, mm -hmm. finding those areas in which we can have a conversation mm -hmm. and then trying to build from there. Certainly that must at times feel like a lonely position to take. From time to time, political fevers rise a little yeah. and people want to... Many people uh, speak against the UN, think that it's been a fruitless effort and so mm -hmm. on. Um, why have you and why has the Stanley Foundation continued to, to see hope in this sort of uh, process you engage in? Well, first of all, I don't think it's quite as lonely as you may Good. be portraying Good. it. There are, <laughs> there, there, there are a lot of people there who share the understanding that we need to figure out how to collaborate and work together. Nonetheless, you're right that there, uh, sometimes there are lonely moments uh, where it seems there, there is uh, uh, more opposition, more things to be overcome than there is momentum to overcome them. But I, 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 think, the, I think the reality is that uh, one gets back to the point of, well, what's the option? Uh, if we aren't going to try to solve these uh, survival issues of the future, uh, what do we do? Uh, eat, drink, and be merry? Is that the end of it? Uh, I don't think so, and I think I uh, and the family believe in the, the value of, of the human species enough that we think it's, it's worth the effort to, to try to do it, and we have been blessed and fortunate uh, to be in uh, positions where we can uh, nudge things a, a bit. Uh, I have often said to people that uh, in our business you have to believe that water dripping on a rock does eventually make a difference, and it does. And I think really we are uh, at a different place today than we were. Uh, the nature of warfare has changed. We have very little of one nation attacking another. The conflict and strife today is more internal ones, where uh, within a country there may be different groups that are striving, vying for power. Uh, those are things that you have to address one, one at a time. There aren't, uh, I don't think, uh, simple one-size-fits-all cookbook solutions, but one needs to get into the specifics of each situation and look for opportunities where one can make a difference on a particular issue, on a particular uh, understanding of things. Uh, that's, that's what we have to be about. Well, I'm sure I speak for everybody in this room, anyone hearing this program, anyone who has encountered the Stanley family, the wonderful art collections that you've supported for so many years and, and contributed to the university. Um, I speak for all of you in saying thank you so, so, so much for everything you've given to the University of Iowa and to the world at large. So please give thank the Stanley family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, I'll do that. We are now going to go to a very special performance in honor of uh, Richard Mary Jo Stanley and their larger family. Kenneth Che, saxophone professor, brilliant artist here at the University of Iowa, and his equally brilliant piano partner here, Alan Huckleberry, who's in uh, the School of Music as well, are going to play two pieces. Uh, would you like to introduce them, Kenneth? Or? Okay. Good evening. We just would like to thank Joan um, for inviting us to perform for you tonight. It's always an honor. And the two pieces we're going to play for you tonight is um, um, uh, two tangos by Esther Piazzolla. The first piece is called Bordel 1900. And the second piece is called Oblivion. And, uh, you know, in, in light of this evening's event, I can't help but think of uh, this expression of diversity. I'm originally from Hong Kong. Alan was in Germany for many years. How many years? 20. 20 years. And we're here tonight in Iowa City playing tangos for you. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm going to invite our next guest up now as we thank Alan and Kenneth for that wonderful music, Astro Piazzolla. Uh, so please, uh, Barry and Janice and the people in our next segment, please go ahead and come on up. I'm Joan Kerr. As you know, this is World Canvas. Very happy to have so many people here with us this afternoon to enjoy the program. And um, if you are interested in watching a rebroadcast of this program, you will be able to find it on cable systems all around the state, also on KRUI-FM uh, here in the Iowa City area on Iowa Public Radio statewide and on the free listening internet site, the Public Radio Exchange. Uh, you can also find information about international programs and upcoming events at our website, which is international.uiowa.edu. Another note, please take a moment as you leave uh, this room this evening to take a look at the Global Health Studies uh, posters, which you'll find on some easels just outside the door. This is research and service learning uh, that has been documented on posters and shared with us by the Global Health Studies group, and uh, there are more downstairs on the lowest level of this building. Also, the prize-winning photos from this year's uh, study abroad and um, Office of International Students and Scholars essay. Their are essays and photos. We'll be talking about them later, but the photos are on display just outside this door. So please do take a moment to look at, at those. Uh, I'm going to start first with Barry Butler, who is the uh, new provost here at the University of Iowa, Internet, um, inter, uh, interim provost, um, and he has been known to us for a long time here at the University of Iowa as Dean of College of Engineering. Very nice to have you, Barry. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And we will start first with asking you uh, to talk a little bit about what the University of Iowa um, it really it takes as its um, sort of guiding principle regarding international education. Why is international education important to a student who graduates in the 21st century? Well, I think everybody in the audience here is, is well aware that it's, um, it, it's more than what you learn in the classroom that makes the person, um, when they finish their degree at the university, it's, it's all these other experiences that you have along the way. And uh, when you look at any aspect of international um, content in a, in a student's time here at the university. Uh, it, it adds to, to who they are and what they know and their perspectives on the world. And it, and it goes really, I think, two ways. One would be the students um, that we um, have visiting us, studying at the university from um, 100 and some odd <laughs> countries around the world. Um, those experiences are very rich for our students here on, on campus in Iowa City. And, uh, and of course, the second piece is uh, when, when our students uh, travel elsewhere to yeah. learn, uh, whether it be for just a short time or an extended period of time, um, all of those experiences add to what I like to call their, their full um, educational experience as a University of Iowa student and, and really just makes them better citizens of the world when they graduate mm -hmm. and, uh, and it will be with them forever. Well, within um, the study of engineering, I, I, if I don't misunderstand this, this uh, progression of studies, very often you are tied uh, to semester to semester. One semester follows another, and it's not quite as easy for engineering students and students in certain other colleges with, with that sort of um, very sort of strict progression of courses to get away for a semester at a time. But I know that some of your courses involve an experience during a semester. There may be a full classroom trip to China or Korea or uh, the Netherlands to study. Right, it, it, and it, depending on the student's major, it, it really, um, how it fits into their curriculum will depend on their major and, and their, their uh, number of hours they're taking. But mm -hmm. when a student has a very um, uh, regimented curriculum that requires certain prerequisites, it makes it more difficult sometimes, but not always. There's <laughs> always ways to get around it and, and ways to be creative. Uh, a lot of faculty and staff have come up with very creative uh, programs. We have uh, winterim um, mm -hmm. courses that are done um, during the holiday uh, semester break. Um, the Hydraulics Institute here at the University of Iowa for going on I think 12 years now um, have um, organized a trip uh, to uh, somewhere in the world every summer to study water projects. They study the geopolitical issues, they study the social issues, they study the technology issues. Um, they've been to every continent except Antarctica mm -hmm. <laughs> to study it, and um, they have taken students from all different disciplines um, and students from other countries. They have, in fact, brought in students from uh, 
Um, I, I was with them in Turkey a few years ago studying the, the so-called GAP project, which is uh, the major source of water in the Middle East. And, and there were students who had joined them from Uruguay and, and um, mm -hmm. other countries in South America, um, students from throughout the U.S. So there's a lot of creative ways to do these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, even the smallest experience can add so much to a student's um, education that yeah. um, I fully encourage any student to consider just uh, any opportunity they, mm -hmm. can, they can come by. Mm -hmm. And just one last question. Is there, do you think there, it's conceivable that a student graduating this year with a degree in engineering would not interact in some level internationally, being hired by a business or so low teaching in a college? A low <laughs> probability. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it's pretty clear that, um, and, and it's not just engineering, it's in a lot of disciplines mm -hmm. where the, the, the world is so well connected. Um, and uh, being able to, um, uh, even if you're not working elsewhere, just understanding um, yeah. people around the world is so critical to whatever you're doing um, that uh, the value to the student is just um, uh, significant and they, mm -hmm. they need to consider it. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the people who makes this study abroad possible is Janice Perkins, who's next to us here. Janice is uh, Assistant Dean of International Programs, and she is also the head of the study abroad program here at the University of Iowa, which has grown and grown and grown over the years, the many years you've been here. And um, I'm sure that you would echo Barry's comments here about the importance of taking that opportunity to go someplace, learn something, whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, about the world beyond our borders. Oh, with, without a doubt, yeah. um, I think, I think um, Barry touched on many of the points that the values of, of international education study abroad, and Dick Stanley, when you were speaking to him mm -hmm. earlier, also um, made some very pertinent comments about the importance to the larger community and society yeah. of our students having international experiences. What are some of the more innovative programs you've worked up in the last few years, would you say? We have um, several programs that have developed over the last several years that have really gone outside the sort of notion of a conventional study abroad program. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, most study abroad experiences were a semester academic year in length. Um, very often were very classroom based. Um, times have changed. Students are looking for different types of experiences and they're, they're recognizing the relevance of those experiences to their future plans and careers. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for experiences that can give them some real world experience mm -hmm. as well as an academic experience. So one of the programs that I was going to mention is the one that Barry just mentioned mm -hmm. about the water resources program that has traveled to different countries around the world over the last 10 years or so, um, really giving engineers some direct experience with engineering projects around the world as well as the context in which those real world problems are based. Another program that's become very, very popular at the University of Iowa over the last four years is our India Winterham program. Mm -hmm. um, and that has grown from one NGO-based course four years ago to we will be offering um, 11 courses, I believe, this winter um, with the involvement of as many University of Iowa faculty. And all of those courses from um, low-cost and sustainable housing to hospice care to um, music and dance in India. So very wide range of topics, but they're all practical courses interacting with Indian NGOs and organizations. Another program that um, isn't quite so hands-on, but is a new innovation is our um, Iowa International Summer Institute, which we will be launching for the summer of 2011, which will offer about a half dozen courses that were developed on the University of Iowa campus to satisfy general education program mm -hmm. requirements, and we've repackaged them, and we're packing them up and taking them abroad, and it'll be the first study abroad program that's targeted specifically to first year students and help them get one or two of their general education requirements out of the way mm -hmm. and expose them to a new country. I can't tell you how jealous I am of freshmen <laughs> now. I wish I could go back and be that place myself. Um, and Janice, one, one other thing. How affordable is study abroad? Is it out of reach for a significant number of students or no? Affordability is one of our top 
priorities. Obviously, we're never going to cut corners to sacrifice the academic integrity or the safety of a program site, mm -hmm. but we know that, that University of Iowa students are frequently dependent upon financial aid and very often don't have the extensive resources available to them that students at, say, a, a private college might have. So we work hard when we develop our programs or affiliate with programs to keep them as affordable as they possibly can be. In addition, the University of Iowa has um, allows students to use any financial aid for which they're eligible to mm -hmm. attend the university toward the cost of a study abroad program with, with very, very few exceptions. So any institutional scholarships or <coughs> private scholarships as well as Pell Grants and student loans can apply. Mm -hmm. And third, we are extremely fortunate that we have some additional scholarship support just for study abroad programs that comes from the university from generous supporters like the <laughs> Stanley Foundation and Dick and Mary Jo Stanley directly, and other sources that allow us to supplement the, the aid that a student receives from the University of Iowa generally. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to skip to the very end for a moment and say hello to Connie Trowbridge. Hello, Connie. Uh, thank you for being with us. Connie is an assistant professor, clinical uh, professor in the College of Nursing, and she does many, many interesting things. But one of the things I thought I might ask you to talk about tonight is your Hikotepec, Mexico project, the classes you have uh, taught there for many years, 10, 12 years now. Would you please tell us what that's all about? I'd be glad to. For the past five years, I've had the opportunity to be involved with the project uh, and a course called International Perspectives, Hakotapec, in which this is a very unique course and a very unique project in that we have a partner, the University of Iowa, partners with the Rotary, Rotary 6000 of the state of Iowa, and we partner then with the Rotary de Pueblo, uh, Hakotapec de Pueblo, Mexico. So this is a very unique project. The project has been ongoing for about 10 years in some aspect. Uh, engineering was originally involved with the project. There was a, a strong water project. Uh, they put drinking fountains in the schools, brought safe, drinkable water to the schools. And that project continues. Um, what I want to share with you this evening is how different disciplines healthcare disciplines with the University of Iowa collaborate and in a course, uh, not only students, but faculty. And this is a, a big undertaking. Uh, it's not just decisions for, from one perspective, but it's decisions from all perspectives uh, to make the team, team work, make the team work well together, and carry on projects projects that in which students can lead, students can follow, and that are sustainable. And the different players, um, pharmacy has a strong team, uh, engineering has been a team, uh, urban planning has been a team, and nursing. And for the past four years, uh, I want to share with you what primarily what our nursing projects are. Uh, we originally started, what's important about service learning is that you go somewhere and you don't take a project and you decide that they, the community needs the project. The community identifies a project and a need and asks you to supply some resources. And so usually in the fall, and right now half of the team is, faculty team is down there, and I'll be going down next week, and we will collaborate with the, the community, collaborate with leaders of the community, and make those contacts for projects that we have already started, projects that are growing, and, and new projects. Uh, nursing first got involved with the orphanage, and the orphanage is a private orphanage that is uh, 59 children from the a few months to 18 years of age, of which there are 59, um, did not have access to annual health care. If there's an emergency, 
yes, they have access. But the ongoing health care that we know they did not have. So they asked if we could provide physicals. And the first year, um, we developed um, a portfolio, a chart for each orphan. And we started with some demographics, and we started with height and weight. Uh, the pharmacy team provided the anti-parasite medication, and we did some fluoride varnishing. Last year, we, we grew the team. Uh, I took down a medical team. We were able to take a day uh, out of the week and give an annual physical to each child at the orphanage. And this meant that we had to intake them. Uh, the records, when we got there, they pulled them out of the box. They weren't organized the way we wanted them to. The names are very complicated. So there was a lot of on-the-spot decision-making and organization. Uh, not only, it's about relationships, and it's about building relationships. So we uh, utilize not only the orphanage folks, but we, we had our team, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that team in a minute. Uh, but we did an eye exam for them, we did a blood pressure if it was age appropriate, uh, and we did a health head-to-toe physical on the children, and then we did the anti-parasite medication and fluoride varnish of their teeth. Uh, the plan is to go back this spring and continue with that, and again, add to, add to the demographics. What's, what's nice about this project is it's uh, the continuity that, that we can provide for the project. Um, other projects we have, we, we took this then to a special ed school, and we'll grow that project this year too. Uh, a new project for the nursing team, well, they've been asking us to participate in a campaign and program to fight domestic violence. And initially that was a program that I thought, that's way too big, I don't know how I can assist, I don't know how we can help in the short amount of time we're there. But it seems to be a very popular topic with nursing students, very popular topic uh, that they do want to take on. So uh, that's the project that we're going to be developing this year. Um, with the interdisciplinary piece, it's important that you not only have your own projects, but that you mingle with the other teams and participate. Nursing, it's pretty easy for us to do that because nursing is general. We have many different aspects of health. So we can join in one day with a pharmacy team and administer the anti-parasite med. We also invite members of the pharmacy team to join us. Another very important relationship that we've developed is there is a school of nursing in Hakotapak. And the very first year I went, uh, there were eight nursing students that showed up on Monday morning for breakfast. And they came in and to the Cruz Azul, they sat down, they ate, they didn't interact with anyone and nobody knew who they were or how they got there. Uh, but we soon learned that they were nursing students. And so it's like, okay, Connie, you take charge. So uh, I developed a contract then, drew up a contract with the nursing school, and ever since, I have a group of six to eight nursing students that participate with us for the week, and they're essentially under my charge. Uh, whatever I ask them to do, whatever we ask them to participate in, they do, and they get credit from for their nursing school from this community experience. The interesting thing is they have seen things within their own community that they aren't exposed to or would not have the opportunity to be exposed to. It's, again, it's those relationships, the relationship with the school, the relationship student to student, the relationship student to the community, and those relationships don't stop there. They email, they write, um, and those are ongoing. Uh, so 
I think I probably used my time, mm -hmm. but some of the main outcomes are relationships, the building of those relationships, the projects, the sustainable projects, the resources, uh, assisting and taking resources. And again, it's that first or maybe early experience with, with a different culture and building a journey to global health. Oh, thank you so much. That's terrific. And, and uh, everyone knows that Iowa City is a city of literature. We have many famous writing programs connected with the University of Iowa. Certainly one of them is the nonfiction writing program. And the director of the nonfiction writing program is Robin Hemley, who's also here with us. And I, I thought it would be fun to learn about your overseas writing program uh, as well, Robin. You have just in these past few years, let's see, Corfu was last year, huh? Corfu, yes. Greece, and Queensland, Australia. You've taken classes to Croatia. Slovenia, Northern Italy, Hong Kong, Macau, the south of France. Um, tell us, apart from the, the wonders of these places, what was the experience that the students had? What was different about the overseas program? Well, um, I, I think it's important for students, especially writers of nonfiction, to know the world, know something about the world. And uh, I think the default uh, mode of writing uh, a lot of nonfiction students is the memoir, so that's writing about the self. But I also think it's important for writers to get out in the world and to write, some, still write about themselves, but write about themselves out in a larger context and to understand something of the, the world outside. So uh, each year I bring a group of graduate students in uh, uh, the MFA programs uh, to various locales, and um, I, I first started with MFA students in nonfiction writing, uh, but this last year we've expanded, and we, I brought about 35 students to Corfu from um, graduate students from the Writers Workshop, poets, um, fiction writers, people from the Translation Workshop, and then nonfiction writers, and it's um, it's an amazing experience for them. Um, they, we've had a lot of um, wonderful um, follow-ups. Uh, one of our, when we went to Croatia, one of our graduate students became fascinated with Croatian literature and Croatian uh, culture, and now she's studying Croatian and going back and forth to Croatia. Another student, when we went to um, Hong Kong, she uh, became fascinated with Hong Kong and now is on a Fulbright there. Um, and so we're constantly I'm, I think it, you know, travel obviously does change people's lives, and it certainly affects the direction of a lot of writers' lives when they uh, go to another culture and become fascinated with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you think of any particular moment where either you, in an interaction with a student, or a student told you that they had sort of an aha experience that, that was really very moving for them? Well, I think, um, you know, I think that that time that my student became really fascinated with Croatia was an aha mm -hmm. moment for her and certainly the, the Fulbright student. And also I had a student when we went to Australia, a student who had never been outside of the U.S. before. He comes from a, he's a wonderful short story writer and a nonfiction writer who comes from uh, the coal mine areas of Pennsylvania, never been outside of the U.S. and so his first trip is to Australia <laughs> and it was quite a, a trip for him. And I remember he, we had a reading uh, for uh, our group. We read at a local bookstore, um, and I remember he was kind of the hit of the reading. Uh, you know, he, this young man who'd never been outside of the U.S., and all these Australian writers were coming up to him saying how talented he was, what, what an impact he made on them, and I thought that was great for him and for his uh, um, sense of himself in the world, not only as a uh, 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 just a, a traveler, but as a writer. Mm -hmm. Is there a, 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 such a workshop plan for this summer? Where are you going this yes, next year? Yes, we're going, uh, we started in the Philippines and we're going back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. One thing nice is that when we went to the Philippines, it was the first time they'd had, uh, well, we went to a place called Dumaguete and they have had for the past 40, almost 50 years now, uh, a summer workshop based on the Iowa model. Um, in fact, uh, the founder of it, Edith Tiempo, who is sort of a legend in the Philippines, she graduated from uh, the Writers' Workshop in the early 60s. And so I brought a group of students there and we participated in the first uh, nonfiction part of that conference that they had done. And now we're going back 
to, uh, to the Philippines, and we're going to be part of their 50th uh, celebration of that workshop. And they're very keen on us coming back because we represent Iowa to them, yeah. and, and Iowa has been very important to the writing culture of the Philippines. Yeah. Well, I think that one of the things we're trying to demonstrate in this little segment here to any student listening or any parent of a student listening, um, virtually every area of study within the university would, would have opportunities to go overseas or, or to do something beyond our own, our own uh, you know, close hometowns. And so, um, Barry, anything you would want to say as a wrap-up to this little segment? Well, you've heard a lot of great experiences from the panel here in terms mm -hmm. of their um, programs that they um, lead to different parts of the world and and uh, to those listening out there and and when you're you know thinking about your education that um, you know some small experience even the smallest of experiences will add so much to what mm -hmm. you take from this university um, obviously some of the experiences you've heard here are, are much more in depth mm -hmm. and longer but just even the even the, the shortest of a trip or something can help you. Mm -hmm. But certainly think about all the opportunities. It's like anything else. There's a full menu of things available. Um, and secondly, to, uh, to those students on campus to uh, really uh, take advantage of the fact that we have students here on campus from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is a very unique experience mm -hmm. that, that they're going to have while they're students. And, the, and they should really embrace that. And that, again, will add to their, to their uh, education as they, um, as they uh, spend their time here at the University of Iowa. Right. Wow. Well, thank you all for coming here tonight to talk with us. I appreciate it very much. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Each year, International Programs conducts photography and essay contests that are very popular with study abroad students and also international students. I mentioned a little while ago that there are some photos that have won prizes on display just outside these doors. Well, the students who are coming up to join us now have just been told this week that they have won awards uh, in, with the uh, photos that they uh, entered, or in the case of Lauren, with uh, their essays. So I will uh, ask these three young women to please introduce themselves. May I start with you, Lauren? Um, sure. I'm Lauren Katalinich. I'm a senior at Iowa. I um, studied abroad in Lancaster, England on the Iowa Exchange Program uh, for the full academic year last year and um, wrote about that. I had a great time. Yeah, so, so you were in the study abroad essay contest. Yes, I'm an international studies and French major actually, yeah. but I decided to follow my girlhood dream and go to England. So. <laughs> Was that your first trip abroad? Um, I had been, I've been to France before. You yeah. had, yeah. Well, uh, let's go to you, Han Anna. Would you uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Anna Volsted, and I'm a second year medical student here at the University of Iowa. And um, this summer I conducted research um, with a professor here from Iowa in um, northeast Brazil on the burden of leprosy in that area. So. And one of your photos won first prize, so congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and then please introduce yourself, Amanda. Um, I'm Amanda Adams, and I'm a senior here at the university, and um, my major is biology and international studies, global health. I spent uh, 12 months in China and also studying in Vietnam and Thailand, so. Yeah. Well, so uh, let's, let's talk about your photo that people can see out here. It's just a terrific photo. Please describe it. Um, it's a picture of a boy standing in front of the giant Buddha of Lushan in Sichuan province in Chengdu. Um, he's just very focused, standing there taking a picture for his parents. Um, and I was just kind of amazed by how calm and posed he was in front of this huge statue um, of this giant Buddha. And he's just, I don't know, I just really like that picture. Yeah, and so one of the toes of the Buddha is huge compared to this mm -hmm. little yeah, guy. But even the, the toe is just yeah. <laughs> massive compared to this little, little yeah. boy. So. And your overall experience in China, uh, what, what could you say? Um, it was it was probably the smartest decision I think I could have made in my college career. Um, of course, I got to travel a lot and meet a lot of wonderful people and learn a language. I mean, that's invaluable. But definitely, by far, the, the greatest thing that I gained by studying abroad was the ability to interact and to understand other people from other cultures. Um, that's definitely been something that I've been able to bring back here um, to my family and to the people around me. Um, who maybe don't get to travel as much 
I think um, I've been able to teach them a little bit about cross-cultural cross communication and just being able to appreciate their own culture as well right. as the diverse environment we have here. So. Right. And is there, is there anything that you could say was the most, the most interesting revelation, um, most interesting difference between the way um, people live on a day-to-day -day basis in China and the way you're used to living here? Was mm -hmm. there anything that stands out? Um, well, space is definitely different. <laughs> uh, when I got there, I was just kind of taken aback by um, the fast pace that I was in Beijing initially, and it's just so fast-paced there. But everybody is excited, I think to just be talking and interacting with anybody. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit different, but definitely amazing. Great, uh, great. So, well, let's uh, talk to you next, uh, Anna. Um, your, your photo, I, I love, it is um, posted out here, and you, you should describe it. It's black and white. It's very, I think, stunning. Why did you take that picture, and what is it? Um, I took the picture one, um, one of the last days I was in Natal, um, Brazil. Um, it's, it was a picture on, on the boardwalk of someone, of their display of like several hats that they're selling to tourists. And um, where we were living was right on, the, right on the beach, like right next to the boardwalk. And uh, we would walk past this every day, just kind of like it got to be just like an everyday like um, background scenery. But then on one of the last days I was there, I was like, wow, that's actually like pretty cool the way they, they set this up. So um, decided to capture that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what was your, you're, you're in medicine. Right. Or pre-medicine. And um, you, what you were studying there, uh, help us figure out what you were actually studying while you were sure. there in the summer. Sure. So I and another medical student went um, to Brazil to study leprosy. Um, uh, leprosy is still a problem, mostly in India and Brazil. Uh, it's um, obviously, it, it was just interesting to study a disease, like an infectious disease, that they have somewhere else and that we wouldn't have the opportunity to study here in Iowa, so. Mm -hmm. It must have been slightly, um, I don't know if scary is the right word, but leprosy is a kind of a, a very heavy word. We all have some yeah, sort of exactly. association with leprosy. Many of us may think that it's been eradicated. Right, Clearly not. which so, it's not. <laughs> so, so, you know, what is that moment when you meet the first patient? Or? Right, it's, it's really, um, it's pretty spectacular because, yeah, you think of, I don't know, like most people think of like deformed people that you like would read about like in the Bible and, so, you know, but it's really not like that at all. <laughs> it's actually a pretty common disease and, um, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's just, it's prevalent everywhere and it doesn't necessarily carry that um, stigma with it um, in the area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. And Lauren, let's let's talk a little bit about your experience in England. Um, you said that it had been a childhood dream to go to England, and you did this for your study abroad experience. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm a I was a French major and took Spanish, um, so I kind of thought I should do a language thing. But I had always um, I had always wanted to go to England, and um, I actually got really lucky because. Uh, one of my flatmates was French, so I ended up actually practicing my French all the time. And um, being there for a year, um, I got to travel during like two of my breaks um, to French and Spanish speaking countries. And yeah, I guess I, I wasn't in London, which I chose not to, I didn't really want to be in a city, so I was in more of a rural area. And I felt like being in a smaller town, I really got to know that community as well as like people at my university, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it was a great experience. That way. Yeah. And what was your essay about? Um, kind of uh, at the last minute before I left, um, I'd always planned to come home for Christmas during that month, and uh, a woman, I'm in a choir at this Oakdale prison in Coralville, and her husband is British, and she just told me, oh, you, you should really stay there for Christmas. And she gave me the address of her husband's family, and so I showed up there like oh. two days before Christmas, and it was about um, in a tiny village with they lived on. Their address was the street, um, Merton Cottage, the street. So it was just my experience that week with them, yeah. and it was yeah. great. So, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's wonderful to have you um, come in and allow us to congratulate you for winning these prizes and also to share a little bit of your experiences abroad. Would you go again if you had a chance someplace? Yes. You know. Yes, 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 yes. Great. Well, thanks for taking the time to come here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> and a reminder that the winning photos and essays can be found on the International Programs website, which is international.uiowa.edu. And uh, this is going to be a fun segment as well. We have two more, uh, well, I guess I can say students, but you aren't students, you're teachers. You are visiting here as Fulbright uh, uh, language teaching assistants. And uh, we have Rajiv Ranjan from India and Ezgi Bache from Turkey. So please welcome Rajiv and Ezgi. <laughs> scooch over one chair because I felt like I'd been ostracized uh, over there on the far right. So um, these uh, two wonderful people have come here just this fall semester and arrived at the university in, I think, August, just before classes began. Yeah, you, you arrived. August. <laughs> right, right, right. So um, uh, first, I guess, maybe we'll talk about what you did at home before you came here as Fulbright language teaching assistants. And then I'd like you to share some of your experiences of Iowa City, some of the things that surprised you. And let me start with you, Ezge. Okay. So what do you do when you're back at home in Turkey? Uh, in Turkey, I teach English. I mean, I've been teaching English for about six years there. But I mean, here I, at the university, I teach Turkish. So this is my first experience teaching Turkish. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what is this experience like for you? Uh, actually, I mean, at first it was kind of scary, but now I really enjoy it. I yeah. mean, before I didn't really get education in teaching Turkish, so that was new to me. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of scared about, I mean, why American people want to study Turkish or why they want to learn Turkish. I was kind of curious. Mm -hmm. uh, I have five students in my class and two in conversational Turkish. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really amazed when I saw that they were really motivated and they really wonder about the language. They ask questions. So I really yeah. liked this experience. So and really what great. have they told you about why they wanted to study Turkish? Uh, actually, um, they all have different reasons. Some want to, uh, they had some Turkish friends, that's why they wanted to uh, learn Turkish. One of my students has some Turkish relatives and he's married to a Turkish mm -hmm. lady, so he wants mm -hmm. to learn Turkish. Mm -hmm. So they all have different motivation, but they are all motivated and they want to learn more about yeah. language. Yeah, wonderful. And, and Raji, what do you do when you're back at home in India? Oh, well, uh, I was a um, master's student of linguistics major and then I did my MPhil, Master of Philosophy in Linguistics, and then I got into my PhD. Then after the coursework, I did register to come here for a Fulbright scholarship. And uh, I used to teach there, but the, it was not Hindi, of course. It was under a professor, I was like a TA, and I used to teach the basic things before professor come and, and say that, okay, these all things are wrong, what Rajiv <laughs> taught, and then uh, I'm teaching your first theory, which is very recent by Chomsky. So I have been a t teaching assistant in, in back in India, but it is not like that. I was not teaching Hindi at all, and this is my first experience of teaching Hindi here in America. Yeah, we had coffee a couple of weeks ago, and yeah. we were just chatting about all this, and they said it's so strange to, to suddenly have to look at, at our own languages yeah. and, uh, and explain them to other people, you know, teach them to other people, because, of course, at, at, at their ages, it's, it's uh, second yeah. nature, and you, you, know, you have to, in a way, almost relearn your own language, Yeah, don't you? uh, I can say, like, my, when I was teaching my, in my class, and my student asked that, why do you use a straight line for full stop rather than just a dot? And then, okay, oh, uh, then I thought, okay, it's, it must be like in a, the way it is. And uh, uh, then I asked, okay, I can reply that the dot is, is an ambiguous. There are, there are many dots in Hindi which you use for the different thing. And then to make them convinced that the language is the way they are. So I said, okay, why do you use the plural verb with the similar subject like I eat? Why don't you use the I eats like he eats? So oh, yes, <laughs> the, yes. the, the language work, the, there are lots of uh, assumptions in languages. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy and I feel good when I could reply my student in a better way. And uh, I love it teaching. Yeah. But the native language, the, your mother tongue is always, you start taking it for granted. But when it comes to a formal setup and the global state uh, platform like this, where you have to teach and you, you are very much pretty sure that I have to make my student convinced with your yeah. answer. So <laughs> it's, it's a great experience here teaching. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a, it's a big, uh, big commitment to take a year out of your life. You, you both have lives in <laughs> Turkey and in India. And you decided to come to this place, Iowa. Did you know much about Iowa before you arrived? 
No, actually, I mean, when I applied for this program, I was expecting to live in a big city mm -hmm. and the American dream. Everyone was, was talking about, okay, you'll have great fun. But I, when, when I first learned that I'll be in Iowa City for 10 months, I was kind of, okay, where is Iowa City? I should check the map first. And, <laughs> uh, and the first thing that people asked me was about, like, is it close to New York City? I said, uh, <laughs> so I was kind of disappointed, but I didn't tell anyone. I said, okay, I want to live abroad, so this is going to be a great chance. But I, uh, when I came here, I really, um, uh, that was great for me because everyone was so welcoming and friendly. So I, I'm so happy to be here. I mean, when I talked to my parents and my friends, they asked me, okay, how's your experience? Because they told me, okay, you'll have cornfields and everything. Iowa actually is kind of in the middle of nowhere. Even uh, the people in the orientation in New York City, they told us the same <laughs> thing. So I said, okay. <laughs> Even the Americans think, think they think that it's uh, a small place. So, but I really have great time here, especially yeah. with my students and my friends here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, glad to hear that. What about you, Raju? Oh, well, uh, I first of all, means when I was in India, I was very much familiar with the University of Iowa because of a professor here, David Ellison. And uh, uh, she is a very good linguist, and I quoted her work many times in my MPhil and master dissertation. So, but I had no idea about the Iowa City in, in general. So when I landed up in orientation with SG in New York, and then I said, where are you guys going? I'm going to Iowa City. Oh, poor chap. So, <laughs> oh, man. And, and then I, I visited Chicago. I visited uh, New York. And then I'm here the first day, the very first day, I, my flight got delayed. And Margie was waiting for me. And then here, from day one to till now, I'm talking here on this platform. I can tell you, believe me, people in our city are so, so, so friendly that you, I never missed my home so far in oh. three months. So I'm really, really very grateful to every faculty. My, I call it FLTA gang. My four FLTAs, my supervisor, and the whole people, those who are related with FLTA's program here. And really, I, today I can tell you, I'm, I'm not missing my home. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and do you find it, I, I'm sure that you see that there are lots of other international students here on campus, so, so have you made friends with other, other Indians who are yeah, working Yeah, I'm staying here? in an apartment, and I, my apartment mate is an Indian, and mm -hmm. we are in a, uh, there is an in, Indian Student Association, and they are oh, yeah. celebrating Diwali this tomorrow, Saturday, so we, I'm in a pretty much well contact with mm -hmm. them, so I'm mm -hmm. happy, I think. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Can, can you tell us um, some funny... Um, incident that happened to you or some little misunderstanding? You, you thought that a phrase meant one thing and then you discovered that it meant something else? Um, actually, I can't think of that kind of a phrase, but uh, in Turkish, generally in the textbooks when we study English, we had British English words and everything. So when I want to order, uh, like, I was saying, can I have some chips? And <laughs> they ask, okay, fries? So with some yeah. little expressions, yeah. we're used to use the British English version. So yeah. here I had difficulty with those kind of words and the pronunciation sometimes. Even if I feel so confident about the pronunciation of water, they say, <laughs> what? <laughs> OK, so I have to think of the American version or how, how should I pronounce it? Yeah. I just think the correct pronunciation. So how would so, you say water? Water. Is that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, I oh mean, my. with my English, actually in Turkey I teach English, but here I feel like a student, a beginner level student, and I always listen to correct <laughs> pronunciation and I try to pick up those. <laughs> yes. But that's you, hard. Both speak just beautifully. Yeah. But you told me about something yeah, that confused Yeah, I, I have a very good experience <laughs> culture-wise and language-wise too. Uh, culturally, when... I was invited on a dinner and I was sleeping by 4.30 and then people called me, are you ready for dinner? Well, what? It's 4.30. The dinner should be at 8 o'clock. No, no, here, I'm in America, dinner is at 5 to 6 o'clock. So, I mean, generally in India, we have dinner at 8 o'clock. So, yeah. that is one cultural difference I found. The other language-wise, that here I, means I'm from India and it's like, we follow, receive pronunciation is of British. And then here I came and then root becomes route, half becomes half, laugh becomes laugh. And, <laughs> and, the, and the funny thing is that when I, uh, I was talking to someone and I asked something like, okay, I asked that you play this, this game with the hand and you call it football. And then he said, this is a good question. And then I was waiting for the answer. If, okay, thank you, you, uh, you appreciate me asking you a good question, but I was, I was waiting for his response that he will teach me something about American football, but he 
he was silent and then it, may, it took me like whole months to understand that if someone is saying it's a good question, it means I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> when somebody say, how are you? And then you say, I'm fine, how are you? And he will never reply, he will just cross by. And then, <laughs> man. <laughs> so these are the few things which I really uh, find myself in trouble and it was a transition period, but now I'm well confident I understand most of the American word, I, it's, root, it's not root for me. I am uh, well oriented in route, laugh, half, <laughs> and, <laughs> and to go or here. And first I, I go for uh, to a coffee house and then they, I need a cup of coffee. I need a half cup of coffee, what? Half cup of coffee and then, okay, for here to go. What do you mean by here to go? Okay, so you want to take it here. So if I'll say I have to go and can I, can't I sit here for five minutes and can ha half thing here and half out of the shop. <laughs> oh man, it was a bit confusing, but now I'm fine. I'm very confident now, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks American for teaching me this yeah. thing. No, but I'm sure this rings a bell for all of us who've traveled knowing how we do things in our own hometown, yeah. you know, you go someplace else and there are phrases where you understand each word, yeah. but, but the concept is something you can't quite grab. Yeah. Um, what do you most look forward to sharing with your friends and your students about this American experience when you go back home? Uh, actually, when I applied to, uh, for this program, they really criticized me because, I mean, you have your permanent job. Why do you risk it? Why do you go there for a year? Uh, are you sure it, it's worth it? And I said, I really want to live abroad and I want to meet different people with different backgrounds. And now uh, I'm so happy that this experience has added a lot to my uh, own life and I have a lot to share with my students. Uh, my students are university stu students. I teach at Middle East, East Technical University. So uh, now I, I take courses, two graduate courses this semester. So I have, the chance, I have the chance to compare being a student in Turkey and being a student here. So there are really great differences, I can tell. Mm. So I really want to share these things yeah. with my students. Like, for example, in Turkey, we never I don't want to say never, but we don't really often go to libraries or we just go there if we want to do a research or if we have an assignment to com complete, that's all. I mean, during the day we don't really spend time in the libraries or we don't really uh, read books or we don't really talk about these things. We don't ha uh, for example, at the University of Iowa, you have the chance to get uh, newspapers as a student for free. Yes, yes. And this is excellent. In Turkey, we don't have this. And I think it's not so difficult for universities to provide this opportunity for mm -hmm. their students. That's a great thing for students. And right, right. I like to share all these things. Mm -hmm. And as a student, actually, in Turkey, we're not really good at planning our lives or <laughs> our future. But here, I think students are more responsible and they're really good at planning their daily lives and their future lives. So maybe, yeah, I'll help mm. them to, we'll try to do it all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on oh, that? Oh, well, I have many things. Well, <laughs> <laughs> as an Indian, I can say that there's, America is a country which is a dream country, one of the dream country for every young generation Indian. They, we all want to come here, stay here. And I'm lucky enough to uh, get a chance, opportunity to be here. And I learned many things. I learned that varieties of perspective of life here people have like oh, they are culturally different i can't say that which india is different and in or which one is greater than which one but that that every perspective of a life is very different here i i noticed i realized lots of freedom in everything like the people are really free students are free the teacher student relation here in america is different than because i am a student here and a teacher as well so i can actually relate these things from back to my country. How do I uh, behave as a student with my faculty member? They're back in India and hear how faculty member are expecting us to behave in, in general. And then how I, I feel my student here in, in America, there are, there are lots of freedom, there are space, there are individual space. And for every, every small or a big issue, the perspective is different. They see the different angles. So, Maybe these things, um, every day, in, uh, from morning to evening, I learn many, I notice people, I, I make friends, and I think I have a bag full of ideas to share back to India. <laughs> <laughs> so you're here until May, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So you haven't seen snow yet? In no. Iowa. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> we may get more snow here than you get in Ankara, and then you get in, in uh, India. I, I was in, in 
2005 I was in Kashmir that is not past part of India and that Kashmir is known for its snowfall and everything. Yeah. But people are, uh, here means what I got, I haven't seen snow here, but people are really scaring us for much. <laughs> 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 yeah, they really scare us a lot about snow. I mean, I, in Turkey we have snow and I really love fall here and I really hope that I like winter here. Yeah, I but I don't know, <laughs> people in Iowa, they don't really encourage us to enjoy it. They say you'll suffer. <laughs> uh, well, I think you'll enjoy it. And I'm just so happy you would come here tonight. Thank you so much. I hope you Thank enjoy you the rest of the year Thank here you. in Iowa. Thank you, Thank you so much. So I'm Joan Kerr, and this is World Canvas, and we're coming into the last segment of our program this evening in which we'll be talking about citizen diplomacy and also economic development and sort of intercultural understanding and training. And um, in a moment here, as people get settled, I'll introduce everyone. Um, most of us realize that governments deal with international issues and relationships, and most of us know that in business and in industry and in education, what happens internationally can affect us here at home. Uh, but there is another important way in which individuals engage in the world, and that is one by one. We've been hearing about that all evening. Uh, many people refer to this person-to-person -person contact as citizen diplomacy, and we have both. Uh, we have three guests here who are going to focus specifically on citizen diplomacy tonight. Downing Thomas, the associate provost and dean of international. International programs next to me on my right, and we have Anne Shadi to my left, who is the executive director of the U.S. Center for Citizen Diplomacy in Des Moines. Great pleasure to have you here, and uh, Jean Lloyd Jones, former legislator from this area, uh, an activist for many, many years on um, peace issues and uh, involved with civic and and other uh, local organizations. I think you are a citizen diplomat uh, by definition, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and a little later, we'll be talking to Helen Jamison and also to Kathy Hill, who'll be talking about economic development. But so Downing, I would like to turn to you first and ask you to tell us something about this whole notion of global competence and how citizens one-on-one -on -one, uh, need to be prepared for a world that is much different than it was 200 years ago. Well, citizen diplomacy as a fact has existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, it's not new. Uh, it's organization into uh, organ organizations uh, nationally and uh, its formalization is rather new. And we're gonna hear about some of those organizations uh, today, including uh, the U.S. Center for Citizen Diplomacy, which is going to have a big event in Washington, D.C. next week, local or organizations here in town uh, as well. But it's really about making connections between people, person to person, uh, on an informal basis or a formal basis, but outside of formal political channels. Uh, and it's uh, important to, to change things that way, particularly now that uh, in the last several years, uh, the uh, need to change the image of the U.S. abroad has come to the fore. Uh, so we'll hear a little bit more about some of these organizations. Uh, personally, I've really enjoyed um, myself and my family hosting uh, people from abroad. Uh, two uh, Russian uh, senior law students uh, we hosted for a semester, a linguist from the Basque country whom we took camping here in Iowa, and that was quite of an inexperience for, for her. And more recently, after the floods of 2008 created some problems here in the residence halls, uh, for the uh, student entry at the beginning of the fall semester. We had two Chinese uh, students staying with us for several weeks, uh, and I had the opportunity to meet their parents, uh, or one, one uh, his parents uh, in Beijing, and uh, uh, they showed me around. So that these connections last. We're still in touch with the Russian law students, uh, the uh, Chinese students are still here on campus. We invited them to Thanksgiving, but they said they preferred to go to Las Vegas. I'm not <laughs> don't sure I understand why that is. Uh, but uh, these, are, these are important connections. And so uh, students who go to volunteer in the Peace Corps are citizen diplomats, uh, people who uh, study abroad or work abroad, 
are, who travel abroad, are citizen diplomats, and ordinary people who spend the time on a weekly or every other week to have coffee with uh, an international visitor are, are citizen diplomats. And these experiences and these connections can be transforming. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anne, uh, we have, I know, very big events coming up with your organization <laughs> next week in Washington, D.C., right. and, and uh, Downing sent me today a um, video with Hillary Clinton talking about the importance of citizen diplomacy and one-on-one -on -one connections, and uh, I know that you have a lot happening next week, so please tell us about the center and uh, what's going on with your summit. Well, thank you. I, I think today, uh, since it all starts next Tuesday, I'm still walking and talking, <laughs> uh, but I may not be in another week. Uh, thank you for having, uh, having me here tonight. The, uh, the U.S. Center for Citizen Diplomacy, as some of you may know, is located here in Iowa, uh, in Des Moines, and it, it really is a result, quite frankly, of a number of people across the country representing organizations all the way from the National Council for International Visitors to sister cities to people who are running the Peace Corps. I mean, it, it covers a wide range of of organization leaders, really, who about seven years ago began to cluster themselves in some small think tank groups and said, whoa, uh, we have collectively more power and ability to share our country with the world than we do individually. And there might well be some opportunity here for us to start thinking about what that collective effort might look like. And to be quite short tonight, because time is running out, the actual result of a lot of that thinking that began about seven years ago resulted in the establishment of the U.S. Center for Citizen Diplomacy, which in fact in today uh, really is the single only organization, although it's only four years old, that in fact kind of serves as a central gathering database collection, if you will, of all of the opportunities that Americans have in this country to be engaged internationally. And when you start to get a, a kind of a, a grip of the breadth and the depth of these opportunities and what this country really does have for Americans to be internationally and globally competent, it's really probably larger and bigger, I am sure, than any other country you know, in the world. And so the effort, and frankly, of the U.S. Center, although it is that place where its website, of course, what else does one do in this age but use technology, to collect all of that information and make it easily acceptable to every American, whether they're five or 95. And what we've looked across the scope of this is that it's, it really encompasses K through 12 education, higher education, the world of business, cultural diplomacy, international volunteer service abroad, the field of development, the field of sports, and faith-based organizations, just to mention you know, a few of those sectors. So in trying to organize all of this, what came into being uh, over the last four years now was the need two or threefold. One, this country really is in a position today to raise the level of consciousness of the American public to the importance of being globally competent. And so one of the major challenges of the center, of course, is education and marketing and promoting and supporting and strengthening and honoring the contributions that Americans are already making you know, in this field. Again, whether five or 95, there are 8, thousand organizations on the tax records, check them, international. That's actually the number of nonprofits. If you compare that to all of the nonprofits in this country, it's a pretty small number, but nonetheless, it's a pretty interesting, I think, and substantial number to begin to focus on and encourage and assist. To your point, Karen, the summit is really a launch, uh, a truly a launch of a 10-year campaign, and the goal is to double the number of Americans engaged internationally in the, in the next 10 years. 
and we can chat more mm -hmm. about that, but that'll give you a quick, mm -hmm. a quick analysis, background, or whatever. <laughs> and this is nonpartisan, I assume. Absolutely yeah. nonpartisan, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. In fact, the chairman of our board is a Republican, mm -hmm. and guess who over here is on our board? <laughs> 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 I won't say anymore. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, I, I'd like to go to you next, Jean. As we <laughs> mentioned, you know, you have had many roles in your life, and you've been very active in community politics, and you were a legislator for some time, and I know that you were involved with the, the Peace Institute in Grinnell. Um, why is this such an important matter to you, um, uh, staying connected with not only peace issues, but th the rest of the world, the larger world? It's so important that, uh, that we tie the world together. Um, there was a very wise Indian uh, prime minister back in 1950, 51, who said, this era will not be remembered for the atomic bomb or for the wars, it will be remembered as the time when the people of the world began to jostle each other. And we are seeing that, I think of that so often when we see the, the growing populations and the shifting and the immigration problems that people are having in countries that never had them before. And it is so important that we learn how to deal with each other in a nonviolent way. And that's been a common thread through my life for as long as I can, as I have any memory <laughs> of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in a group like um, uh, Civic, which welcomes international visitors um, to communities around Iowa, right. um, there might be some people who would think, well, you know, what difference can it make? You host a little reception, you invite people to come meet some uh, group traveling here from, say, Somalia or from uh, Korea, uh, South Korea. Um, in, in the long run, you know, it's just a coffee or it's just an afternoon's conversation. Can't really make much difference. Do you think that's true? No, and I think that civic is where um, you can be a citizen diplomat and meet people from all over the world without ever leaving home. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so easy here in Iowa City because the world, in fact, does come to us. Um, the opportunity to have a person in your home and discuss, as my husband and I did a couple of, two or three nights ago, <laughs> with a member of parliament from Nepal and uh, Another visitor that was with us at the same time was a um, man from Pakistan, and we talked about the tribal structure over there and how they felt about Americans being in Afghanistan. And in, uh, there is no substitute for this. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one conversations that you have. Um, you know, Civic entertains about um, 70 to 80 people a year that the State Department sends us. And we are volunteers partnering with the University International Programs who furnishes an office space and some other uncountable um, benefits. And one, one of the um, Foreign Service officers who was traveling with a group from Brazil a few years ago said, you know, nobody ever requests to come to Iowa. <laughs> First of all, they've never heard of Iowa. <laughs> and uh, when they're in uh, New York or San Francisco, somebody will ask them where they're going next, and they say, Iowa, and they say, Iowa? Why are you going to Iowa? So they have very low expectations <laughs> when they arrive in Iowa. <laughs> We meet them at the airport with a little flag of their country in our hand. We immediately have their hearts, if not their minds yet. Yeah. We bring them to Iowa City. We put them up at the Sheraton Hotel, which we don't pay for. The State Department pays for that. And by the time they leave us, after we have connected them with the professors that they want to meet, or we've taken them to the Stanley Foundation in Muscatine, where they meet with professionals in the field that they want to know about, 
and we've had them to dinner in a home. They leave saying, Iowa is the best place there is, and we don't want to leave. Mm -hmm. And often they say on their evaluation sheets that this was the highlight of their trip. And I think it's because of the personal attention that we give them. Um, we're one of about 90 such organizations in the country. And um, it's fun to look at their schedule because they'll have, um, they'll have Dallas, Fort Worth, and they'll have um, Boston, and they'll have Los Angeles, and they'll have Iowa City. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it's kind of nice yeah. to be in, yeah. Yeah. in that situation. Well, thank you. So, so uh, back to you, Anne. Um, I, I take it you have great hopes that, that not only will the organization be able to um, encourage this greater mass to develop around um, citizen diplomacy and uh, volunteerism well, and whatnot. It, there have been over 200 experts in international affairs that have worked for nine months preparing uh, various task force reports and roundtable reports uh, for the summit. They're all done. And... Uh, about 600 plus uh, individuals have uh, registered. 20, 39 states and 40 countries uh, will be there. We've had good fortune, uh, although an interesting journey, uh, developing a partnership in all this with the U.S. Department of State, uh, particularly the Department of Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, which is the logical uh, part of the State Department really to partner up with. But there, there's a cute historical, cute might not be the word, <laughs> uh, historical aspect to this. Historically, and Dick, I know you will know much of this, uh, on September 11, 1956, Eisenhower called together about 150, 65 leaders from all over the country in Washington. And it was a real push on the part of the White House. The State Department was adamantly against it because they really felt that what he was doing was telling the message to the American public that the State Department wasn't doing their job. But in fact, uh, he pushed, and a gentleman under his staff named Washburn uh, really was a leader in this, and they had the meeting despite the State Department's total objection, uh, and there was a compromise, and that was, in fact, that there would be no publicity about that meeting. But what he did was he brought together the chairman of General Mills, the president of American Express, the chairman of the board of New York Life, the head of the Motion Pictures Producers Association, the head of the Catholic Bishops Council, the head of the Girl Scouts, the head of the American Wrestling Association. William Faulkner was there. Very interesting list of people, and we've had staff, of course, go to the library and dig out all of the correspondence on this. And what he said at that meeting was, uh, you know, there's, he gave a wonderful speech. It was about eight minutes long. And basically, the conclusion of that speech was, I need your help. The government cannot do this alone. And what that spurred, of course, out of all of that came what only Americans do, they formed committees, <laughs> and there was the business committee and the religious committee and the agriculture committee. It was so typical of what our, our society does. But out of all of that came literally the founding of Sister Cities International, and not too many years later, the National Council for International Visitors that Jean was talking about that program. The project HOPE, the SHIP, that goes around the world providing medical assistance, that came out of that meeting. Of course, People to People, the organization that's based in Kansas City, wonderful story, Mr. Hall of Hallmark, good friend of Eisenhower's, and said, how can I help? And he said, well, you know, establish a People to People organization. It is in Kansas City. It is run by Mary Eisenhower, his granddaughter, but it's in Kansas City, of course, because Mr. Hall's company is there. Uh, and he donated a beautiful home for the headquarters. All of these organizations kind of got sprung out of that meeting, and 54 years later, we're in another century. The issue that Eisenhower was addressing at that time was the Cold War, and that was the good guys and the bad guys. I mean, it was kind of a clean. Today, we're talking about serious global issues that are not very... Uh, clean, I would say, 
And so the purpose of this summit is to try to, in a sense, really renew and launch again another time when we say government cannot do this alone. And we're ready. We're ready with today, after 54 years, far more ability to address this collectively or all of the global issues collectively than we were ever you know, by ourselves. And the State Department is actually a collaborating partner. So it's an yeah. interesting Thank twist. You. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're going to wrap up our discussion tonight by, by bringing in people who work with the business community, with industry, with Iowa's uh, economic development. I'll go first to Kathy Hall, who's at Kathy Hill, who's at the uh, very end of our uh, uh, group of guests here. And thank you, Kathy. You've come over from Des Moines today. And, That's right. And you work in the uh, Iowa Office of Economic Development and International Matters. I'm in the International and, Trade Office at the Iowa Department of Economic Development. Mm -hmm. And what we do there is we help companies who have a product or service service, market it to other countries. Uh, we have trade specialists there, and I'm one of them also, that uh, my area specifically is the Asia Pacific region. I've been traveling there for, well, since I've been in private industry, so it's been about 30 years. And then um, <laughs> I've also been, um, I'm also the team leader for the trade office. So, but what we do is we work with companies either like a consultant, because uh, those of us who work in the office, we have private industry experience so we know how to move a product from point A to point B and get paid for it. And uh, so we help companies do that. And we also help them uh, either by taking them to the country and organizing pre-qualified business meetings for them. Or we have inbound delegations coming into Iowa. So if you won't go market your product to another country, we will bring the market to you. Next week, I have Australians here. Chinese, uh, large Chinese delegation coming in uh, that's going to be working within the soy industry because right now, even though China has slowed down a little bit, we hear today on importing soy, they are the largest soy importer in the, from the United States. Um, and so we, we work with that. We have uh, trade missions that will be leaving for Mexico. Uh, we have uh, ag meat mission going to um, China, Hong Kong. Uh, because we're hoping that the pork markets will open up to us more soon, uh, pretty soon over there. And then I will be taking a mission to northeastern China, and that will be a manufacturing service mission to northeastern China in June. So what we do is we try to take companies to areas of the world that they might not think of as their first market, that they might need a little hand-holding to get to. And so what we do is we'll arrange everything, their business meetings, everything that they need, because we just want you to go and sell. That's all we want you to do. Yeah. <laughs> and so you've been there 20 years. What kind of growth have you seen during that period of time? It's been, the, the Iowa's exports, uh, the growth in Iowa exports have been incredible, but also there's been a, a change in the way that the statistics are gathered. So those of you <laughs> students here who have to take statistics, you understand that uh, the, the things can change. And so the way the statistics have gathered, but, uh, and, and one who loves statistics, I just brought, we have uh, the third quarter uh, numbers for Iowa for 2010, and so far, we're at $7.9 billion of uh, manufactured and value-added goods exported out of Iowa. This is not a lot of our commodities. The commodities are, are counted differently, and a lot of that is not in here. These are identity preserved. That means that the documentation shows that they left from Iowa. And so what I'd like to say, though, is everybody thinks the economy is, is maybe not as good as it was. And I, and I always tell companies when I do a lot of public speaking, don't look at your 2008 books and everybody wants to forget their 2009 books. Look at your 2007 and compare your 2007 numbers to 2010. Because again, those of you who are in, do statistics, you take out the high and you take out the low, right? And you figure what the average is. And so that's what you should be looking at. Take a look at what you did in 2007 and now compare it to what you're doing. And you'll see even in Iowa statistics that we are up about uh, $800,000, 800, Eight hundred eighty-eight thousand, actually, uh, over uh, this same period in two thousand seven. Mm -hmm. And to the business community in Iowa, the people who who might be looking for these new markets, how do, how do you get the word out that you can help them? We have a we have a database, we have a newsletter, mm -hmm. and we get we go out and we're out uh, visiting communities. We use what I like to call multipliers, economic developers, chambers of commerce. Uh, we host a lot of um, uh, educational 
types of things, so we have it in advertised in the newspaper where INCO terms, the internationally accepted terms of sale, are changing as of 2010. We have the uh, international representative of the United States uh, on the INCO terms committee coming in December to teach the new INCO terms to um, all the Iowa exporters, so we, we're putting out things in newspapers, so that brings in people that we don't necessarily have in our database, but we have a database of about 2,000 or more companies that export. <laughs> And so that's who our main database is, but we're out talking to people all the time, trying to get more and trying to find more companies that export. Mm -hmm. One was put, uh, information about one company was put on my desk today. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so, well, so this is Kathy Hill, and thank you so much. Thank we may have, have more time to talk about that. I'm going to move right now to Helen Jameson, who works in international programs, and, and she's specifically in charge of something called Going Global in Iowa. And tell us how you interact with Iowa businesses and with other businesses. <laughs> Yes, it's a wonderful opportunity. Going Global in Iowa really grew out of a program that we offer here on the University of Iowa campus for faculty and staff called Building Our Global Community. And that program was really targeted at um, helping faculty, staff, everyone on campus work more effectively with international students. It's been quite successful over the last six years. Three years ago, we received a, a seed grant from the university to start to develop these programs and offer them off campus. And what I mean by these programs are, are they're cross-cultural training programs. Um, we look at intercultural communication. We do, we talk about things from student visas to cross-cultural communication to um, conflict, uh, cross-cultural conflict resolution and, and, and prevention as well. Um, so I think that's very consistent with the economic development goals of the, of the state of Iowa as well as the cultural competency goals of the University of Iowa and diversity goals of the University of Iowa. And it, it's been a wonderful opportunity. We've, um, they're interactive workshops, they're customized, and, and I think some of the things that, that make our program unique, Joan, are the the, the wonderful resource we have in our international students. We have international, we have roughly uh, 3,000 international students and scholars on campus um, who are a tremendous resource. They represent um, over 100 different countries. So we have this wonderful resource um, that we want to share with the state of Iowa. Um, also, uh, we, we have facilitators who interact with, um, like me and others, uh, who, who interact with internationals on a daily basis and sort of have those practical know-how uh, sort of skills for, for cross-cultural communication. Um, so it's been very successful. Um, we've, we've also got the University of Iowa campus, so some sort of opportunities to pilot programs mm -hmm. and, and so on as well, so that's nice. We've worked with um, local banks here in Iowa City. We've worked with um, larger financial institutions, um, international corporations. We've worked with a, a small um, manufacturing um, uh, industry uh, up in northern Iowa. And we've also worked quite a bit with community colleges. And uh, last week we were at Mount Mercy College um, doing a program, a training program for their faculty and staff as they see the international student population grow on their campus as well. Um, I should correct myself, Mount Mercy University. Uh, <laughs> so recently a name change. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what would be an example? Say, say an, interna uh, an international uh, corporation of some sort has offices here in Iowa. Mm -hmm. I, I think there is such an example. And they, um, they wanted to bring a workshop in for their own staff. Uh, what are the kinds of questions they want to have you address? What are the problems they perceive within their workforce? Well, oftentimes I think, I think um, People know there's a problem, but they're not sure even where to start with the questions. And, and that's, that's difficult. They know there's friction um, maybe that has to do with cross-cultural communication or how cross-cultural teams work together, which is very common. So what we come in and do is initially we do quite a bit of assessment. We're very assessment oriented. Um, so we do focus groups. Um, we use a tool called the IDI, the Intercultural Development Inventory, which assesses, um, it, you can look at it um, both at sort of where a group falls along a continuum of um, 
cross-cultural competency development, or you can look at individuals within the group and, and give some feedback. And, and it's a very well-researched tool um, and, and very helpful in deciding how to target and customize the workshops that we offer um, so that we're hitting the right level. If we, if we know where people are at, then we can design programs um, specifically um, to meet their needs. And I, I think that assessment piece is key. We also use a tool quite often called um, the Cultural Conflict Styles Inventory, and, and that one we use a lot when there's, when there's conflict situations within groups or um, negotiations abroad, what have you. Um, and then a lot of what we do is, is helping people create welcoming environments. So we might work with a local bank that, that wants to serve international students as effectively as they can. And, and so, so we talk about how do you create an environment where students are going to, to feel welcome and, and students from all over the world will feel welcome and, and, uh, and served well. So. Wow, terrific. So we have just a couple minutes left. Uh, anyone want to make some closing comments? Having heard all of this, do you have anything further you want to add, Anne? Of course, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, I find it very interesting, uh, hi, you know, historically, that we have had presidents in our country who, through the years, you know, have all kind of gotten it. You know, they have seen, you know, really the critical importance of engaging people uh, in international affairs and not government. And they've all said it, I think, in some very interesting ways. And of course, I know. I'm talking to a university audience, so I mean, you will clearly know Kennedy's wonderful uh, inaugural speech uh, and his famous phrase that almost all of us, I think, today can quote by, you know, by heart. Uh, but then it was President Carter who founded the Friendship Force, uh, which is still a very viable organization and very active today, based in Atlanta. And to a degree, uh, you know, President Reagan certainly did start a number of, of efforts that w put citizen volunteerism, I think, at a, you know, at a height. Uh, probably his emphasis there was not quite so strong in terms of the international outreach, but certainly, you know, was an internationalist himself. The, um, but I, and, and if you want me to call, I've got some wonderful quotes that I think these, some of these leaders have said, and I'll just share the similarity, which is almost a little kind of ironic. It's kind of like they're all up there talking to one another. <laughs> But what Eisenhower said was, if we are going to take advantage of the assumption that all people want peace, then the problem is for people to get together and to leap governments, if necessary to evade governments, to work out not one method, but thousands of methods by which people can gradually learn a little bit more of one another. Secretary Clinton, we must work to reach people through governments, around governments, and under governments, quote unquote, in every way possible. And this requires substantial people-to-people -people contact in which we try to reach each other. Obama, now is the time for all of us to take our share of responsibility for a global response to global challenges. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't end it anywhere else. Doesn't that sound like a good finish to this program? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please stay here. So in this segment, just to reintroduce everyone, Kathy Hill is at the far end. Thank you for coming over from Des Moines. Helen Jamison, we thank Jean Lloyd-Jones, Anne Shadi, and Dean Downing-Thomas. Thank you for being here. Uh, a special thanks to uh, Dick Stanley for being here this evening. And, and we send our hellos to Mary Jo, and please give her our best when you get home. Uh, thank you so much for, for participating over all these years with university and international programs and all of these fine efforts. And we congratulate you on the International Impact Award. Uh, also, thanks to President Mason for uh, coming over and for Provost Butler. Thank you very much. So, uh, big thanks to all of you for coming here this afternoon. If you'd like to look at this program again, it will be on UITV, uh, many cable stations around the state, also on Iowa Public Radio and on the Public Radio Exchange. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to all of our uh, colleagues here and our partners in this production, the very fine folks at UITV, also ITS, International, or excuse me, Information Technology Services, uh, KRUI, and um, 
well, of course, our home base, international programs, and the museum here. So thanks a lot. Uh, don't go away uh, too quickly. We have a reception on the second floor here. I hope you will join us for that. Uh, greet Dick Stanley and his many friends who are here with us tonight. Our next program is December 10th in this room, uh, 5 o'clock. And the topic that evening is the American West of the Imagination. We have some great guests. I think it will be very interesting. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you.